Hello, it's Aaron here at the Battle of Preston Pans Jacobite Museum with the 11th video update for our What If interactive war game campaign. Imagining what might have happened in 1745 and 46 if the strategic decisions had been taken by our social media followers. Now, thanks for all of you who've been following along with the campaign so far. Things are starting to get quite exciting. Uh, there's a lot taking place, a lot of new soldiers appearing on our campaign table uh, and therefore a lot of painting work. Uh, so I think I should give a shout out to especially uh, Dave and Brett, uh, who've been busy painting up figures along with myself uh, to make sure we're in a position to fight out the next phase of the campaign. When we left you last, it was with this dramatic image, the French fleet escorting a large French army across the Channel to the south of England. And I can now confirm that the French have landed. The Jacobites' allies, inspired by the Prince's march down towards the capital, have come good and crossed the Channel. And as you see from the campaign map, our eyes are now very firmly fixed on the southeast of England. Prince Charlie and the main Jacobite army moving down the Great North Road towards the capital from the north. The French have landed at Hastings and have spent a little bit of time consolidating a bridgehead there. And they are now looking to push upwards towards the capital from the south. Cumberland has successfully brought what remained of his armies from the northern campaigns down by sea and has linked up at London with his father, George II, and they're pulling every available man into the ranks for the defence of the city. And the Hessians have landed at Chatham, and those regiments a crucial bolstering reinforcement to George II's final defence line. Now, I was asked in the comments on the last video if I could update you on the situation back in Scotland. And the reality is that really nothing up here has changed since the tide of the war flowed south. Uh, the Jacobites have garrisons at Newcastle, at Berwick, at Edinburgh, Stirling and at Blair and Cromarty's regiment in Inverness at Fort George. The government forces, they still have garrisons in Carlisle Castle and then north of the border in Fort William and Fort Augustus, but those garrisons are very small. Uh, the two great Glen forts uh, barely mustering a regiment between them. So they're not in a position to do any offensive action, really. Uh, and uh, the rules that we would played to in the campaign meant that uh, the British army wasn't able to recruit new recruits in the south of Scotland uh, if either Stirling or Edinburgh had fallen. And they weren't able to recruit in the north of Scotland if uh, Inverness, uh, Fort George, had fallen, the principal arsenal there. Uh, so uh, the defeats by the Jacobites of the Redcoat forces or the loyal clans uh, in the battles at Ardesia uh, and at Seven Mile Bridge and at Glasgow had effectively removed the leadership of the uh, government loyal uh, Highland clans, MacLeod, Loudoun and Argyle. The only way that these two British army forts in the north of Scotland will make any uh, impact on the campaign just now would be in intercept actions if the Jacobites rolled successfully for recruitment in the western highlands and attempted to move a regiment past these two forts, there might be uh, an intercept action uh, similar to that we're going to talk about in a few minutes time. Uh, but actually, the recruitment roles for the Jacobites in the Highlands particularly have been really poor uh, at the last few opp opportunities. Uh, and so most of their recruitment has happened in the south and more recently in England itself. So that's where we are in Scotland. We don't expect there to be any sudden resurgence uh, of military activity there. But it's worth noting the Jacobites in these garrisons have a fairly large amount of manpower tied up, which potentially means that if the war does move back into Scotland, uh, and it seems a long way from doing so, uh, then the Jacobites do have the potential to, uh, to raise uh, large forces again. Obviously, not everything is happening with the main army, as there's other activity around the country as well. Uh, the Jacobites had recruited a regiment of infantry uh, under Francis Townley uh, that had moved down and linked up with the main army as it came down through Yorkshire. Uh, another English Jacobite regiment had been raised at Morpeth and that has moved down and taken over duties in Newcastle, uh, freeing up Monaltry's uh, regiment to head south uh, towards uh, the main body. We'll talk more about that in a moment for sure. 
The uh, British Army recruitment, although most of its uh, recruitment has been taking place in terms of militias in the south and the home counties for the defence of London, they'd also raised new regiments of militia in York uh, and at Derby. Specifically, the Yorkshire Blues have been ordered to hold in that area so that King George still has a presence in the north of England, as well as Carlisle Castle, uh, maintain some communication there. The Derby Blues, however, were ordered to try and get down to London to bolster the uh, militia forces that were gathering in support of the regulars there. Uh, but it seems the Jacobite movements have been too quick for them uh, and the road to London is pretty much blocked uh, for the Derby Blues. Uh, so at the moment, uh, they're trying to either tack their way around to the west uh, or uh, resign to operating in the hinterland behind the Jacobite lines. They might yet have an important role to play, who knows. So that gives us uh, the lead up uh, to our uh, latest uh, tabletop action, which is an unexpected and pretty minor affair, which happened in Yorkshire on the 21st of January, 1746. So alas, I'm not going to be bringing you in this video news of any great confrontation between French, Hessian, Georgian and Jacobite armies. All that is still to come as everybody's jockeying for position, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, I am going to bring you the update of one of the smallest uh, and quickest tabletop actions of the campaign so far. So just going back to what I'd mentioned previously, we have an English Jacobite unit which was raised in Northumberland uh, and they marched down from Morpeth and took over responsibility for the garrison at Newcastle. That freed up a Highland regiment, Manaltries, uh, which was available therefore to march south and link up with the Prince and uh, bolster his infantry force there. So that's what they're doing. They're heading south, uh, hoping to be able to take part in the big battle that is likely to come. They're heading down on the Great North Road. There are two branches, one that goes through York itself, which seems wise to avoid. The other, which I've highlighted in blue here as their route, goes down through Weatherby. There's Weatherby at the bottom left. Now, because they are within, at this point of the road, one day's march of the garrison in York, that triggers in our campaign an intercept roll. Now, the roll of the dice determines whether or not the garrison decides to try and intercept the uh, advancing enemy and whether they're successful in finding advantageous or disadvantageous uh, positions to do it. Now, this was a very good roll for the uh, York militia. Uh, they're over here at the city. Uh, they got a role that said they would be able to intercept Monaltry's Highlanders in an advantageous position, which allowed them to ambush the enemy. So we determined that they would be marching out from York and heading up to this position here, where they would catch the Jacobites as they came down towards the River Nid. As ever, this was then my excuse to trawl through 18th century maps and try and find a location to put our skirmish uh, into action. Uh, this is the landscape I worked out would be the most likely. Uh, here's the River Nid, not a particularly formidable obstacle, but nevertheless. Uh, and we have the villages of Walshford here in the centre, uh, and then just off on the high ground towards the east, uh, Hunsingur. The Great North Road, which will be the Jacobites' line of approach from the north, comes through Walshford, over the Bridge of the Nid, and heads off towards Weatherby. Now I've turned the map upside down, just to make it easier for us to understand how this translates onto the tabletop. So I'll just remind you of those features. There is Hunsingor on the higher ground, centred on its church. There is Walshford, and the Jacobites will be approaching from the north, which is the bottom of the table, along the Great North Road towards the Stone Bridge. The York militia will be coming in from the Weatherby direction to stop them. Putting that onto the tabletop, we have the village of Hunsingor uh, on the high ground over here, the Nid, obviously, the village of Walshford with its coaching inn, and the stone bridge uh, carrying the Great North Road. There's a number of options for the deployment of the York militia. There's uh, an obvious temptation to occupy the strong high ground at Hunsingord Church. 
And just for comparison, there's the view of it in real life, as opposed to on the tabletop, uh, the church uh, rebuilt a little bit later, uh, showing that later design of spire there on the tower, but giving you an idea of how Hunsingor uh, dominates the landscape here. Over at Walshford itself, there's another opportunity here where the Great North Road is funneled down between the buildings of the small village centred on the Coaching Inn and Smithy as it heads towards that stone bridge over the Nid in the distance. And that bridge is, of course, the objective of uh, Ferguson of Monaltry, the leader of this Jacobite regiment, who wants to get his men as fast as possible down into the south of England to link up with the prince uh, so that they are able to lend their strength to the final push towards the capital. So the Jacobites will be heading onto the table from the north, heading down the Great North Road and across this bridge towards Weatherby. Now, it's been a while since we did one of these small intercept actions. They were the type of engagement that dominated the early uh, weeks of the campaign when we saw the Jacobites consolidating their position in the Highlands of Scotland. In fact, we've already referred to the uh, engagements at Seven Mile Bridge and Ardesia Kirk. Seems like a long time ago now. But you may or may not recall we had special rules for these actions. For example, uh, a, a, a single regiment could subdivide on a successful order roll into two smaller units to give you more tactical flexibility and uh, a pre-deployed force a defender uh, would be able to start in this position without requiring an order roll. Uh, so that's what we have done for the Yorkshire militia they decided to deploy half of their strength in the coaching in uh, area commanding the access to the bridge and although the second half was tempted to go into the churchyard at Hunsingor to threaten the rear or the flank of the uh, approaching Jacobites, they in fact decided on something much simpler and went in uh, to the cottages on the other side of the road. So they focus all of their firepower on protecting the bridge. To uh, replicate the idea that this is an ambush on an unexpecting enemy, the Jacobites will arrive from the north in column and they will not know of the enemy's position until the first shots are fired. Uh, now, they will have a number of uh, possible actions when they come under fire. They can either try and push their way up the road uh, to the bridge or indeed to engage the enemy, or they could try and swing out to either side of the village where there is more open ground or indeed they might decide to try and bypass the ambush altogether uh, and take a longer slower route uh, detouring uh, around past the ford over the nid uh, near uh, Cathal. So Ferguson of Manaltry's uh, forces march onto the field as I said in column marching past those dry stone dikes towards the bridge in the distance unsuspecting uh, that the York militia might have come out to try and stop them. Then all of a sudden their peaceful march through Yorkshire is interrupted by musket volleys from both the Cochin Inn area and the cottages on the other side of the road. Monaltry's men are caught in column. They're also on the road and between two sets of dry stone dikes. So they're in a difficult position. They're going to need extra orders to get over the dikes and redeploy. Uh, and of course, from column, they're not able to return the fire uh, of the enemy. Uh, so what is uh, Monaltry going to do? Uh, firstly, he does very little in the first move because the first volleys successfully disorder his ranks. And it looks like it might be a very dangerous situation indeed if he's sat uh, there stuck, disordered on the roadway. Now, the Yorkshire militia don't have it all their way because there is actually a, a penalty for them uh, at the coaching inn because there's not a completely clear line of shot uh, towards Monaltry's men at this point. Uh, and, uh, of course, by having divided into two, into two locations, they uh, have a relatively weak firepower as individual units. So although Monaltry's men do take hits, uh, they are not devastated uh, by the initial advantages that the enemy seems to hold. And there we see uh, the uh, young Baron Van, uh, Ferguson of Monaltry himself, uh, rallying the men, getting them ready for the next action. And much to our disappointment, I am sure, 
but perfectly sensibly in the context, Manaltri's decision was that he would not be lured into an engagement, he would not waste orders trying to get himself over the dikes and into the open, or try and clear these buildings. Instead, he remembered that his principal military objective was to get his regiment south as fast as possible. And with a successful order roll giving him three moves to do it, he simply rolled his regiment in column straight up the Great North Road and onto the bridge uh, over the Nid. So discretion has clearly been the better part of valour for this regiment, uh, and they have got themselves through without uh, suffering more than a couple of lost men along the road. And since it's perfectly possible for the uh, Yorkshire militia to get back to York by going across through Hunsingor uh, and Calthrop, they're going that way. Uh, once the enemy has passed them by, uh, they gather up the wounded Jacobites as prisoners and they take them off back towards York. The York militia are able to trumpet this as a success because they're able to claim that the Jacobites uh, came under fire uh, and uh, declined to attack them. And although they failed to stop the Jacobite force getting through, uh, it is they who take away the prisoners and the wounded. And so we will allow for a recruitment bonus at the next uh, recruitment rolls for British loyalist forces in this region. So a fairly uh, undramatic episode, uh, but nonetheless one that will be written large in the annals of the history of Washford. So after a skirmish that took longer to set up than to actually fight, Ferguson and Manaltry's regiment is moving down towards the Prince, although of course the Prince himself isn't standing still and is marching down towards London, uh, extending always the uh, distance between him and Manaltry. There's a good two weeks marching, I think, uh, ahead for that little regiment. I did also mention earlier that there is a militia force at Derby that has been trying to get south towards London, but has had its passage blocked by the Jacobite advance. It remains to be seen whether the Derby Blues might attempt to cut Monaltry off before he gets down to the main force. Let's wait and see. However, all eyes are really moving down now to the southeast of England. And turning to this uh, fantastic mid 18th century map, we can get a sense of what's happening in that corner of the kingdom. In the centre, we have George II, who's taken personal command of his remaining field forces at the capital. And uh, linked up with Duke of Cumberland and his survivors from Spennymuir, this army now has a number of regulars. It has the guards battalions. It has the militias that have been raised across the south of England. And it has... Uh, even some marines who've been pulled onto land service from the Royal Navy. The second red circle at Chatham, that is the Hessian division under the Prince of Hesse Castle himself, uh, and they have successfully landed uh, in support of George II. Of course, the blue circle at the top is Charles Edward, who's coming down through Cambridgeshire now uh, towards the capital from the north, from which, however, he's not able to coordinate properly with the French army, that blue circle there down near Hastings. The French army is very large. Uh, it's about uh, 11 regiments of foot supported by uh, cavalry and uh, guns, smaller than the prince's own force, admittedly. But they're not able to coordinate their actions at this stage because, of course, of the distance between them. So with that in mind, the Jacobites have voted on Facebook to only advance so far towards London before starting to tack round to the west in order to try and open up communications uh, with the advancing French. The question for uh, the Redcoat forces is how they are going to respond uh, to this potential encirclement, uh, whether the Hessians will simply march towards London and bolster the army there, or whether that small force will attempt to try and hold a line along the Medway to prevent the French from linking up with the Jacobites. All that remains to be seen. The Redcoats are making their last preparations as we speak. As always, thank you for watching. Thank you for following the campaign. Please leave your comments and we look forward to an update in the not so distant future.